Dr. Dr. Brad Bundy, who will regale us with some fascinating stuff about brain neurochemistry, neurobiology, and what that has to do with addiction, not just chemical addiction, but pretty much all addictions. Now, he's not going to focus on addiction per se, but rather, let's talk about the brain and, and changes, and stuff like that. So, you're going to enjoy it. Guaranteed. Money, money back guaranteed if you don't like it. So, there we go. Typically what we do is we take roll from the students. You guys are here just to ask questions, interact with our students, vice versa. Get as much information from our speaker as you possibly can, and we'll all walk away a little more informed and hopefully a little more committed to making a difference in this very, very important area. We're going to take a quiz first, and we'll see how much you already know about the topic. So this should be a lot of fun as well. The good news is nobody knows what buttons you push. So try to give me as honest an answer as you can. And then at the end, we're going to ask <coughs> questions again and let Dr. Bundy have some commentary along the way to see if, if you're answering in a way that, that shows some progress. This is just telling us a little bit about the program. Uh, again, we've had quite a, a roster of speakers it, we're not necessarily best first if anything the best last it's tough to get this man uh, pinned down and, and hopefully he'll, he'll be able to, to give us as much as he can in, in his time a lot but anyhow this is just telling a little bit that, of what this collaborative effort was about um, working with the community working with the university working with some some local experts in the area. I think we all need to continue this dialogue, both here locally and then wherever you find yourself um, stationed in, in life. It's a huge, huge problem, and, and we just need to take some ownership of whatever we can do um, for chemical dependence. One more talk this semester, and it's more a video with a discussion from uh, a couple of the directors in Focus on Friends. These are recovering addicts themselves. What a wealth of information. They had some of the highest evaluation marks from last semester. So it's always just so compelling to hear somebody who has been through hell and back and to share some of their stories and to, to be there um, trying to assist others that, that might be having friends, or family members, or themselves afflicted with this disease. All right, you ready? The first one doesn't count. But here's what happens. Tell me what you think here. The US, which represents less than 5% of the population of the world, uses more than half of all the opiates. Go ahead and try to push C and see what happens. Go ahead, try to push C. What happens? Right. Yeah, yeah, you get a little amber light saying, eh, it doesn't work. So then go back and pick your real answer. And if you hit the wrong button, hit the right button right after, it'll take your last entry until I hit this computer and then it's going to move on. Anybody else want to get in here? I got 22 votes. All right, let's see what people say. Aha, so most of us are thinking we are opiate consumers, absolutely. All right, now that one was from last week's talk. Here we go for this one. How many brain cells are there? How many neurons are those in the brain? <laughs> I've met people that I'm sure are less than A, and I've met people that have thought they were more than D, but what do you think the answer is? That's one of those silly questions, except this, this is a thousand-fold increase for each one, so it kind of gives you a, a sense of where 23 votes, let's see. All right, a lot of us think it's 100 billion. We'll see. The area of the brain associated most closely with that dopamine reward is which of those areas? Which of those areas? Dopamine reward. Can I get one more vote? We had it. There we go. Thank you. All right. Most of us are ready for that nucleus accumbens discussion. There's some other areas that Dr. Bundy will discussed as well that are involved in behavior and memory and 
triggers and stuff like that, but but obviously if you're talking about the dopamine reward, you guys are, are heading in the right direction. The process by which new neurons are created. New neurons being created, new brain cells from the stem cells, human stem cells. seems to be a plurality of votes for neurogenesis. That would make sense, wouldn't it? Neurogenesis. What about the ability of the brain to reorganize connections and patterns of communication? Which of those terms applies to that concept? Right. Neuroplasticity. Some converts already, so this is all good. Addictive substances can cause physical, what we call organic changes in the brain. Or is it just functional? Most of us think it's absolutely true. All righty, well, I'm gonna sit down and shut up, turn over the podium or the floor to Dr. Bundy, um, who is a physician he works here in town, does incredible things. Oh, you know what? Um, there is one, whether it works or not. I just never used it. You know more about this than I do. I take it that most of you are with, with what I don't know is if there's direct, a chance. Some people could be community, right? So no, I've got, I've got kind the, of maybe I need to disconnect my, my, uh, my input. And it looks like I can't get the audio input from my own. I'm going to plug it back in. You want me to contact? I'll go back with you. So, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Hey, I wouldn't really sure. I, 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 I'm going to be talking a lot, kind of off the cuff. I'll be using my, uh, my slides. Uh, I wasn't real sure what you all would want to hear, but I'm going to go over some stuff. Hopefully, it'll be helpful. And as I go through this, maybe some questions. I'm going to have to be out of here probably by about quarter after seven, seven thirty. Actually, I got I got a patient up at the hospital at Orchard Hall, the psychiatric unit, that uh, is in there for an opioid opioid problem that I got to see a little bit later. We admit some patients up there. Usually, they're dual diagnosis uh, substances as well as comorbid psychiatric. I'm going to start off, but I really want to focus on addictions. That's what most of you want to hear about, correct? A little bit about addictions in the brain. So I'm going to start off with, I'm going to start off with a case study. In, in medicine, we use case studies. It's the presentation of a patient case we've been involved with uh, as a learning tool um, to learn something and maybe change our treatment behavior, case study in medicine. There's a couple things, a couple learning points I hope you'll get out of this. And I'll go over what those learning points are a little bit later. But let me present the case. Uh, it's a patient I saw was over 15 years ago. And I'm not going to break any confidentialities. Uh, the patient was about a 58-year-old male. I saw him in the ICU. I was consulted in the ICU uh, because this patient was psychotic. He was having visual hallucinations. He held us on the wall. Plus, he was agitated and aggressive, going out IVs. That bit of information, most of the doctors right away know what this patient's primary problem was, alcohol. He was in, in going through DTs, delirium tremors. That's what happens with severe alcohol withdrawal. They get psychotic, they get delirious, sometimes they have seizures, sometimes they can die. Uh, what other medical problems does this guy have? Uh, he has cirrhosis of the liver, the alcohol. He had what's called porter hypertension, kind of a buildup of 
pressure in the liver that resulted in what are called uh, vein varicosities, esophageal vein varicosities, which is a serious problem. So medically, it was kind of a mess. And plus, it was difficult to deal with. The type of patient, I didn't want to be consulted on. The type of patient that people work in the hospital, don't want to deal with. And I'll tell you why. We do, it's because number one, they are difficult patients to, to help medically. But number two, it's frustrating. Lisa was back then. It's a little bit of a revolving door. They come in, get tuned up, they go back out again and drink, they're back in two months later, you go through the whole thing again. Each time it gets a little more difficult. So this guy was kind of a mess medically. And socially, he was even worse. Uh, his wife had left him a while ago, several years ago, three kids. They wouldn't have contact with you. People with substances, they burn bridges. Um, the substances kind of take over and relationships and suffer. And people in relationships with people with substances often pull away. Uh, the only supports he had was people at the bars he drank. Uh, financially, he was in terrible shape. He didn't have insurance. Every time he came in the hospital, a huge bill that we, society, had to eat. Kind of a drain on society. He had been involved in, in the legal system, several DUIs. He'd have a blood alcohol level of over 0.3, which he was fine with. I don't know if you guys know blood alcohol level. Lim, limit, the legal limit is 0 0.8 or 0 0.08. 0.3, a lot of people, me for example, I'd probably be out for a few days. His tolerance was so high, he was pretty functional, but he was over legal limit, several DUIs, been incarcerated several times. Um, what else about him? He had uh, some dementia. There's something called course of dementia. When people drink, they get some brain swelling, and when they go through a little bit of withdrawal and they get demented, so it's hard to talk to. I'm assuming by now people are getting a little bit of an opinion in this guy, a little bit of a, I don't know, judgmental opinion, a moral opinion, kind of a, kind of a bad guy or whatever, kind of a drain on society, just kind of Guy making vegetables, right? Um, that, some of that setting in. All right, so before though you finalize your opinion of this guy, let me tell you some more history about this guy. Um, came from a poor family. Oldest of three. His dad, alcoholic. His dad left at an early age, and the only time his dad would come back was to try to get money from the mom and rough up the family a little bit. Until this guy turned about 12, he fought back. Dad never this guy was quite a physical specimen in his day. Actually, um, he was a great athlete. He was captain, quarterback of the football team, leading scorer on the basketball team. Great guy, top of his class, brilliant. What else? He raised his siblings. He took care of them. He worked a job part time. His mom wasn't real functional. His mom tried her best, but she also had some substance problems. She ran on that side of the family. Hers was more, you know, some stimulants, some pain pills. But he took care of business. He helped raise his family, he helped his mom. Top of his class, star football player, got a full ride to college. And there he excelled too, right? Yeah. Football team, the uh, fraternity president, married one of the cheerleaders, top of his class, got an MBA. And then from there, he went into the business world and was a superstar. Fortune 500 company, wrote, went up the ranks, high six figures, made a lot of money, but he earned it. He helped this company become very, very productive. Right? Pillar in the community, he was involved with Moana's, Rotary, a lot of tra charitable events. Uh, that was there. It's driving force in him that really resulted in all this productive, positive behavior, right? All right, probably a little bit of an opinion of this guy, right? But he also had another force in him that was driving things. And that other force that was driving things in him, started drinking in high school. After the football games, everybody go out, let's have some beers, right? College, fraternity, beggars, drink there. Business world, free martini lunch, all right? Let's get business done, let's have a few drinks. For a lot of people, they can control it. For him, he couldn't. It was genetic risk. 10% of the population have a serious addiction problem. 10%. You think about 10% of 
of the population has the genetic risk. We'll back to that later. So, as this driving force of alcohol became stronger and stronger, it overtook the productive drive in him to get stuff done. They're drinking more and more and more and more DUIs. Everybody tried to help him. He went to the Betty County, anybody remember the Betty Ford Center? Went to the Betty Ford Center a couple times, all kind of treatment. Everything was tried. Everybody wanted this guy to come back to them, to work, to the family. And he won. Desperately. He couldn't because the alcohol. He took away everything from him. He lost his job, he lost his money, he lost his family. The year after I saw this guy, and actually I saw him as an outdated for a while. I liked him. The year after I started seeing him, he lost his life. The uh, cirrhosis, the esophageal varices, ended him. But about 58. So how do you make sense of that? How do you understand it? Well, the only way you can understand it is. Understand a little bit about the brain. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And what I'm definitely going to talk about is the disease model of addiction. First learning point, okay? This is what I want you to pick up from that case study. I'll elaborate on it, is that addictions is a disease. So let me read my book. first slide. I get to it. Yeah, you're going the right way now. Behavioral health, neuroscience, we've known for a long time addiction is a illness, a brain illness. All the other medical specialties are starting to understand it too. The New England Journal of Medicine, one of the top in the world. Yeah. Recent article, the neurobiologic advances in the brain disease model of addiction. It's a brain illness. Let me go over that. To help you understand that, I can understand a little bit about the brain. Beautiful picture, right? That's it's called diffusion tension, tension imaging. It shows the white tracks of the brain. You guys know a little bit about, I'll talk about that. The brain, um, this amazing organ in our known universe. Guys, anybody, anybody hear my other lecture? Anybody know whose brain that is? Anybody recognize that brain? You, you were there in the other one? You know, you know whose brain that is? Anybody know? Recognize that brain? It's not mine. Anybody know? Einstein. Einstein's right. Yeah, I, I saw Einstein's brain. The brain weighs about three pounds. It's about two percent of our body mass. The brain takes twenty percent of our blood flow, twenty percent of our energy, twenty percent of our food, oxygen goes through our brain. Two percent. It is working away. It is the most important organ in our body. It's the most complicated. It's the most demanding. Um, we're learning about the brain because of all the scans we're able to do. We, we have what are called functional imaging of the brain. We can show the brain in action. And as we see the brain work, and we can understand what part of the brain maybe is doing what. And that leads us helping understand some of the illnesses of the brain. Um, a little bit more about the brain. The uh, neurons are the main workhorse cell of the brain. Actually, 100 billion neurons. Uh, we lost 15 billion neur neurons in the last Year. There was someone that came out, they, these all nuclei of neurons, and they, uh, it's closer to 85 billion, sorry guys, we only have 85 billion neurons, okay, we can't brag too much to the other mammals, but that's a lot, 85 billion neurons, and if you know anything about the brain, what the brain does, we'll go a little bit later, it processes information, um, we have 100 trillion, you think, yeah, I don't know what kind of does, 100 trillion connections, and synapses, 100 trillion of them. I, I throw this into the mix. There's some other cells out there helping out. They're called glial cells. They kind of clean up the messes and keep the, uh, the neurons healthy. But they play a big role. We're learning more about that, too. So I'll elaborate on all this stuff. But bottom line, 100 billion neurons, actually 85 billion, 100 trillion connections. It's an amazing organ. We'll never fully comprehend our brains. I don't think so. But we're learning more. But if you want to know what our brains do simplistically, I haven't got it. Anybody here, the cup to the head thing, they already do that? 
You want to understand what brains do. Here we go. What, this is what brains do. Brains take in information. Part of the information our brain takes in is what's going on outside of us. What we hear, see, feel, taste, smell, we take in through our senses. And part of the information our brain takes in is what's going on with the rest of our body. Our heart, our stomach, pain, that flows up to our brain. And what our brain does is take that information, processes that information through 85 billion neurons with 100 trillion connections. You get behaviors out. Information in, behaviors out. That's what our brains do, okay? So the example I use, I'm going to use this because you guys are not throwing. So you guys heard this, you guys heard the cup at the head thing? I'm going to go over this again. I'll go through it quickly. <laughs> okay, but if you haven't heard it, okay, so if I took uh, this pointer and threw it at you, all right, what would happen is your eye, the retinal cells in the back of your eyes, those receptors back there, they would sense the wavelengths of this pointer coming at you. They convert that information into electrical data impulses that go into your brain. There's a point to this, you did very well. Anybody ever see? You guys seen Inside Out, the movie Inside Out, the anime? Inside Out, yeah, it's a great movie. You can't see Inside Out. Okay, so that information would go into your brain. First part of the brain, that information, the pointer coming at you, would go to what's called the thalamus. The thalamus are a bunch of little brain cells that monitor information coming in. Most of the information coming in isn't that important. I don't know, the lights shine and maybe somebody moving over there. But every once in a while, some information comes in. It's deemed important because little brain cells that are hooked up with memory bank circuitry, that's more parietal lobe, neocortex. Those little brain cells remember things hitting your head hurts. Man, that's important information. They put an alarm out. So that information is going to other parts of the brain. Part of the brain that goes to is little brain cells, little neurons, that are involved with decisions, motivation to engage in behavior. We think that's kind of flowing through a part of the brain called the anterior cingulate gel. Those little brain cells get information, this pointer's coming at you, and they'd be sitting there and you're thinking, you know, you're talking to each other, the pointer's coming, you know, should we do something? Yeah, we, we probably should do something, and you know, it may hurt it. Well, what are we going to do? I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to scream, we're going to cry, we're gonna, what are we going to do? What are we gonna, and little brain cells up in the memory bank circuitry are yelling at these guys saying, hey, we know what you do. You, you bought the cup of work before, guys. Come on, you bought it. Like, oh, yeah, we bought it. That makes sense. That information is one else where it goes to the little brain cells to get our body ready to engage in the behavior. Get our muscles tense, our heart beating faster, because it's going, that information. Little brain cells that engineer muscular movement. When I scratch my head, the engineering feet, the muscles in my arm, my forearm, my finger, to get my finger here, not here, here, with this touch, not that touch. These little gaps are working right through the neurons, got to move this, got to move this, all stuff going, right? And while that's happening, the pointer's still coming in, right? right? And those little brain cells from the thalamus monitoring the, the pointer coming at you, there's a new guy on the job, and he's running around screaming, oh no, oh no, the pointer's coming, what are you going to do, what are you going to do? And there's an old pro on the job sitting up there, relax. All these other circuits and channels got it covered. The right moment, the button's pushed, and hopefully you block the pointer, right? Let's see if you do it. <laughs> block the pointer, right? Okay? Now, the reason I go through Two amazing important things. Number one, all that information processing. Literally, billions of neurons, trillions of connections work. I, I don't even get their message. I don't even come close to all the activity going on. All that information processing and behavior, behavior out happens like that, right? That's amazing. But here's the important thing, all right? All that processing and all that behavior out happens like conscious. You would have conscious drive anything. You wouldn't sit there and say, uh, what am I going to do? I'm going to fly or duck with it. Then move it from this hand, but do it now. It's going to all happen. Information in, behaviors out. That's what brains do throughout the day. And the vast majority, not all the behaviors we engage in, are unconsciously driven. Conscious when, it, when we walk, when we drive a car. Me talking here, I'm not really consciously stringing each word together. I couldn't get anything out. Parts of my brain know what I'm trying to get out formulate the words in the order they're supposed to be, I move my lips, it's all consciously driven. So conscious awareness, what's it do? And when we think about conscious awareness, we think about willpower, right? And all the moral, judgmental things. Conscious awareness, what's it do? What kind of can do some stuff and tweak things, but actually what conscious awareness does is makes us miserable. We just focus on negative stuff, fears, anxieties, whatever. 
simple as that. These circuits and channels are conscious circuits and channels kind of like a show. And when we put a judgmental component on people, you don't have a willpower. And I'll tell you, I'll maybe point out where willpower comes from. Uh, that's not reality. Right, does that make sense so far? But you guys uh, got that point. Hey, anyway, everybody understand. So, one of the, yeah, one of the buttons that there we go. Okay, so here is, here's our brain, and here is kind of the most powerful circuit channel and conscious circuit in our brain. It's called the Seeking Reward Circuit. All right, we've got all these circuits, Seeking Reward Circuit. That's the one that gets involved in. So let me explain the seeking reward circuit. Remember what our brains do is information and behaviors out. If you really want to know what brains do, all brains, including ours, what brains do is try to get food and not be survive. Everything our brain does is geared for survival. Survival for ourselves, survival of other life forms that are important to us, be it family, friends, or whatever. And again, conscious circuit. So this circuit, the seeking reward circuit, and I'll go a little more in depth into it. Um, that circuit seeks things out in our environment that our brain, kind of unconsciously, thinks helps our survival. And when it gets something that it thinks helps our survival, it gives our brain, another part of our brain, a little reward, so we'll keep doing it. All right? Reinforcement, right? Seeking reward circuit. So what triggers this circuit? Well, that's good for survival. Food, especially sugar. I mean, I got a whole, I could talk an hour about it. Food and sugar. I'm going to war against sugar. It's addictive. Um, what else triggers this circuit? Social connection. Interacting with somebody socially productively. We are a social creature. When we connect socially with people, our survival chances go up. So social connection triggers this. What else triggers it? Mm, probably sex a little bit. Again, that's breeding, that's survival. What else triggers this circuit? A lot of times knowledge does. Knowledge, you get knowledge. Survival chances might go up. You know, learn how to make a fire. You learn how to do that. What else triggers this circuit? Activates it. Substance of addiction. Alcohol, stimulants, cocaine, painkillers, heroin. I'm trying to think, why would that trigger this circuit? Well, think about it. When somebody drinks, a lot of times people get anxious. They're in social settings. I don't want to go. I'm so anxious. They're distracted. They can drink, I'm going to calm down. And when they calm down, they can interact a little bit better with people, right? So the brain says, it must be good for us. Gives itself a little reward, right? Um, pain pills. You're in pain. That distracts you. Anything that takes us out of the moment diminishes our survival chance. If we're out of the moment, if we're thinking about something in the past, if you're distracted, we don't maybe see predator or prey. So pain pills. You miss pain. Brain says, well, that's probably a good thing. Gives itself a little reward, all right? Now the problem with substance of abuse, though, I mean, they hijack the system. They take it over. And let me explain a little bit about some of the dynamics in the system. But they take it over where nothing else that used to work is powerful enough to activate the circuit. And this circuit needs to be activated. It needs, in a way, to get to this reward. The substance of addiction take it over. But that's the only thing that matters. Let me I'll try to go over some of the dynamics. If, this makes sense to you. Um, Transmitter, a messenger between brain cells, which send the messages back and forth, called dopamine. Ventral tegmental area is part of the substantia niagara. We got names for all these parts of the brain. That's where the kind of the messenger called dopamine is kind of made, and then it extends through neurons up to different parts of the brain. Now, this part of the brain right here, the nucleus accumbens, you guys are right about that. That's kind of where the reward happens, all right? It's part of the Olympic system more basal ganglion. That's where the reward gets activated. But it's not quite that simple. There's other parts of the brain that are having input on this, okay? 
This is part of the brain over here called the prefrontal cortex. And that's what you know we're so proud of as being humans. Our prefrontal cortex is the most advanced in all mammalian species. And the prefrontal cortex is kind of maybe where willpower might emanate. It's called executive functioning, considers options, what we're going to do, what's good for us, what isn't. Again, unconsciously driven. Uh, gosh, that had to get fully developed until people were 25. Some of you under 24? Yeah, that's when you do stupid things sometimes, okay? Because <laughs> as far as the brain, the prefrontal cortex isn't activated. And you make it to 25, but they got too much trouble, you, you'll be better off, I think. So, yeah, that, yeah, we'll, we'll it. so um, the prefrontal cortex plays a role, but it's, it's not. Compared to this other circuitry right here, it's not real powerful. That's maybe the kind of a real power. Now up here, up near, it's called the neocortex up on top, that's kind of where the memory system is. And memory plays a role in this. Because what happens with substance of addiction, the seeking reward system, part of it is seeking, all right? Seeking something out in our environment, our brain thinks is good for us. And that's almost as powerful as getting the, the thing that brings reward. Seeking social contact, seeking knowledge, seeking the substance. It's almost as powerful a drive as getting, if that makes sense. And that has to do a lot with memory circuitry up and up, neocortex, parietal. And that has, um, when I talk about treatment, I'll get back to that. So it has a little bit of the circuitry, all right? A little bit of the addictive circuitry. We're learning so much more about it. And the one learning point, these are two learning points. Um, one, you know, and then I'll move on. One is that, Addictions is a brain illness, all right? It's a brain illness. There's no doubt about it. And number two, this is an important learning point, we need to let go as individuals and as a society the judgmental components we put on people. We've got to have consequences. Unfortunately, there's some of this dynamics is a consequential cir circuitry too, and it plays a role. So we've got to be aware we, there's consequences, accountability to our behaviors. I'm not saying maybe with addiction, if we're getting in trouble, they don't need to have consequences. They, they do. But we need to let go of this judgmental component we place on people with addictions. And if we do, number one, it'll be better for them. Number two, it'll be better for us. It'll be better for society. The way we approach addictions right now is not working. You know, you know what we're doing is locking them up, right? The worst thing you can do, you lock somebody up, they're getting away from all kinds of social supports. Uh, number two, they're losing options for employment. What they have left, they have substance and kind of a life of crime. That might be revolving around the substance. Incarceration, $35,000 a year. Proposed treatment, $5,000. A lot of places have figured that out. You familiar with drug courts? People familiar with drug courts? We're pushing the drug courts here for a long time. We got it now. The judges are great. Um, I've been doing it for 10 years in Texas. Texas had the highest incarceration rate in the world, more than Iran. They were going broke. They said, what are we going to do? And they said, maybe we should take them out of prison, put them into treatment because it's cheaper and it saves them over a billion dollars in the last 10 years. It's a society. We try to help these people out. We get people back, not only to their families, but to work. We hope they get them out of incarceration. Um, oh, sorry, so second learning point, attitudes got to change. Because if we're going to change the way we approach things, we've got to be able to understand this is these small. Um, Let's stop for a second here. I think we're doing okay with time. Any questions about this or feedback or pushback? Anybody? I don't know. If people disagree with me. I'd be fine to say something. But any questions anybody has or feedback about this? Does it make it, it kind of make sense a little bit about some of these dynamics? Okay. Zana, you want to hear a little bit about treatment or not? I can talk more about the brain, you guys, because that that's kind of my little spiel. Kind of aside, the, uh, the case study that I gave, uh, I'm going to utilizing the addiction symposium that's happening Saturday. People don't know about the addiction symposium at the hospital. You know about that? On Saturday, every year at the hospital, we have a uh, symposium for the docs, a CME, that uh, they get credit for. And every year we pick a topic. Last year was infectious diseases. This year it's addictions. And it's going to be really good. I mean, the, the speakers here, the national level reputation. I'm going to present my case that I did just with you guys. Kind of good for me to go through that. Uh, I'll present it, but it's going to be a really good symposium kind of set up if anybody's interested. Um, so, uh, 
what's asking. So, any questions about addiction right now? You want to hear about treatment? You want to hear a little bit more about the brain? Uh, can you just really get out of here? Yeah? How does the brain, when someone chooses prescription medications, uh -huh. and deals their, you know, just their life mainly when you have anything wrong with you, and you take prescription medication, Oh, you're talking about like for other psychiatric conditions or? Yeah, that or when you choose just to obey a doctor's orders. What are you talking about? Pain medication or? No, not pain. Well, pain medication in my personal life. Mm -hmm. I took it when I had surgeries. But just until I didn't need it anymore. But when it, when it comes to you know psychotic meds, I took them for 21 years, and I'm healed okay. um, from bipolar disorder. Okay. Yeah, you kind of said, yeah, I don't want to elaborate too much on other psychiatric conditions. I hope you understand the the, the 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 focus I think most people have is kind of on the addictions. Okay, mm -hmm. but when you choose the addictions with the prescription medication, what happens? I'll talk about prescription medications when you talk to it's opioids. I, I was going to go over pain medications. Let me go over a little bit about pain medications. And kind of aside, not everybody that takes pain medications will get addicted, but the people that have a pretty good chance is genetic history. When we talk about this system, uh, we're learning about the genetics. There's something called glucocorticoid receptors. Uh, the genetic risk, about 10% have a receptor structure that leads to the risk of this illness. So there is a genetic component that goes on. But the pain meds are a big part of it. The pain, I guess, people talk to you about the pain medication situation and how that's led to the, you know, let me back up. I'm talking about opioids because that's the hot, that's the hot addiction right now. Um, so actually alcohol is much, much more costly to us as a society, individually, collectively. Um, I'm gonna tell people it's alcohol is kind of the slow, the slow killer of the time. Unfortunately, the opioids, Opioids, are narcotic pain medications, and heroin, they're really more acute, deadly substances. You guys know how that works with the, with the narcotic overdoses? Just briefly, to give you some insight. And again, do you want to hear about medication assistant treatment for, okay, for addictions? Okay, because, uh, yeah, part of what we're trying to do now with, um, well, let me back up. I'll go over a little bit about the, about the, the pain pill epidemic. 20 years ago, it was decided. Uh -huh. 20 years ago, it was decided you treat chronic pain. Treat chronic pain. Chronic pain. Pain's interesting, too. We don't feel pain in the periphery. If I pinch myself here, I don't feel the pain here. I feel it up here. The signal goes up the neuron to my spine. It goes to another neuron. It goes up to the brain. Up the places it stops off, and it goes to the buildings itself. So we experience pain up in our Okay, so 20, and that's especially chronic pain, back pain, migraine pains. 20 years ago, pain societies came out and said, you need to start treating chronic pain. It's the fifth vital sign, you need to treat it, treat chronic pain. Old the doctor told them, right? The studies came. Okay, let's treat, treat chronic pain, all right? And boy, we sure did treat cr chronic pain, right? Here you go, 90 Percocet, 100 Oxycontin, boom, boom, boom. You got a toothache, and, here, and here's a whole bottle, right? All these pain medications got out there. And a lot of people do fine with pain medication. You have the genetic risk for these illnesses, you don't. Okay. You know the number one people that are kind of having problems with pain are athletes, high school athletes. You know, they got on pain pills maybe because of injuries. So, pass on all these pain pills, and a lot of people are getting addicted. It's been, to some degree, the medical community fault. Kind of a sign. Yeah, I shouldn't say this, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Uh, 20 years ago, when all this information came out, uh, they looked back. Because now they're saying, the last two or three years, and now we're starting to say, don't treat chronic pain. Don't give so many pain medications. Chronic pain gets worse, actually, than death. But anyway, 20 years ago, the studies they drilled back was funded by, the studies were funded by, pardon? 
pharmaceutical industry, $20 billion a year industry, $20 billion a year industry. Uh, and they're starting to look back at some of the studies. And they're saying, yeah, you guys, you, I, we need pharmacies help. You got you to help us drill down on what are good studies are on. Um, yeah. And so, whoops, we made a mistake, right? And we're trying to rectify it. But for some people, it's been too late. So, what, what can we do to help people out with, with these illnesses? There's a lot of things we can do to help out. Um, part of it is medication assistance. Maybe I'll talk about that first, medication assistance. And I'll talk about the opioids since that's kind of the, the, the big one right now. Rightfully so. So you guys understand much about medication assistance or not? There's two main, it's, it's giving people medication to try to treat the illness. And for medication <laughs> assistance for opioids, there's two main groups. And there's two approaches. One is using what's called an agonist. An agonist medication for opioids is basically giving the person the opioid. It's methadone or suboxone. Is anybody familiar? You guys familiar with methadone and suboxone? They're opioids. And what they do is remember I talked about the circuitry, right? And Cap I didn't elaborate. One of the things that happens is it's the reason the addictive substance takes over. The circuitry, some of the neurons. It's called down regulation. It's almost the neurons, especially the ones in this ventral tegmental area that goes up, the dopamine release up here. When it's getting stimulated too much, too much of a good thing, the brain says, we've got to slow this down. And so the system adjusts kind of mechanically. The receptors, you understand, and, you know, neurotransmitters, the way brain cells work, there's a gap between when a message comes out in one brain cell. When it reaches a gap, it releases these biochemical pellets called neurotransmitters. Dopamine is one of them. They go across the gap and they hit receptor sites on the next cell. When enough receptor sites are activated, boom, the message goes on, right? That's how it works. So when you get too much of the addictive substance and too much of this neurotransmitter going on, this is it. We've got to change and we're going to down regulate. We're going to reduce, and it's mechanical. It's all, and we'll be able to get into neuroplasticity, neurogenesis, but not too many receptors. We've got to reduce the receptors, all right? So we're not getting triggered so much. When the receptors get reduced, definitely the other stuff that used to trigger the system, social contact, food, learning, doesn't trigger it, doesn't go. The only thing that triggers is self-abuse. When people go through an addiction and you get off the medication, there's two things that can happen. Most immediately is withdrawal. I talked about alcohol withdrawal, life-threatening. Opioid withdrawal is not life-threatening, it's very uncomfortable. People get through that. But what remains after the withdrawal is called craving. And that's this system, the you know, seeking reward circuit, needing the substance to keep itself activated because nothing else can. It's called craving. Okay? And that's why people, they'll, they'll get clean three months later, six months later, nine months later, they relapse. Okay, because this system's been damaged. And remember the genetic component. For some people, this system is downregulated to be different. And, and that's the reason they fall into pretty easy. So that's called craving, right? Yeah. Um, I was curious if you knew the difference between the um, brain withdrawing from an addictive substance and the brain withdrawing from like what patients who get serotonin. From what? With for patients who get serotonin syndrome? Serotonin syndrome. Serotonin syndrome is too much serotonin. That's, that's not addiction. That's not. That's not. I just wondered if it was like if there was a similar. It's not. It, what? What? Again, to go back with, when we talk about withdrawal, alcohol, opioid withdrawal, that's a whole body phenomenon. And I'll go. That's and that every organ system is affected, but to some degree with craving, which is different. It's just this circuit in the brain. It's been damaged. It's not functioning well, it persists. That's crazy. And to get back to treatment, opioid treatment, medication assisted treatment, the options one is giving the person the opioid, giving them the medication. So this system is spending all its time and energy seeking it out. And it's illegal, and you get into, and, it's, and it, you don't work, and you're not with your family, because you're always seeking this. So, Give them suboxone, which is 
in a way kind of an opioid. I won't go into depth about Suboxone, just want to hear it. Or methadone. They get they get the they get the the system satisfied. They don't have to spend all their time seeking out the, the, the drug. Get back. Get back to their family, get back to their work, get back to hopefully being productive for society. That's an agony, suboxone and methadone. And some people need to be on it for a couple years. Some people need more, depending on what their genetic component is, risk. All right, so that's the box of method. You guys got that? Now, the other thing that's being used, let's speak mine, I'm a real big fan of this, is called an, uh, an agonist, or I'm sorry, an antagonist. Vivitrol, naltrexone, you guys familiar with naltrexone? Basically, medication called naltrexone, it's an injection called Vivitrol. It's a medication that just kind of blocks the system, so nothing gets through. So people get on Vivitrol and they take pain pill heroin, can't get through. There's no, no response. For some people that might work, they don't have a really diseased brain. I, I hate to call it a disease, but it is, genetic or whatever. Uh, just stay away from the substance. Highly motivated, they have other options to satisfy this system, a lot of social support for a lot of people. There's a lot of controversy about that right now, so I'll throw it out there. Um, but those are the two medications. Right? And then the other thing that helps help these people is support. You know? Support from others. It triggers the system. That's why AA and NA kind of works well too. But again, internal kind of uh, Just briefly, um, as long as I got this up here. The overdose deaths. Uh, people are dying with overdoses from opioids, uh, heroin included. The substance hits a lot of different parts of the brain. I talked about this seeking reward circuit, but where it can hit is down here in the brain stem. This is called the medulla, and that's where the respiratory centers are. And opioids here in a bad way. The way they activate is they diminish its activity. People suffer. And the reason people were overdosing is they did get off the medication. Right. They go through some treatment, three months, six months, and this craving is still there. But the system's kind of adjusted a little bit, especially down here where some receptors are. So it kind of upregulates, so it's a little more sensitive. Remember, it got desensitized to the, to the, to the opioid, the heroin. Well, once that upregulation helps it, it goes on a little bit. The dose they used to take of heroin is too much. Uh, and then plus, part of what's going on is just lace and stuff. It's fentanyl, you got some weird fentanyl, and you never know what you're getting. They're, they're coming out with knockoff pain pills. You guys savvy about pain pills, oxycontin, Percocet. They're coming out with knockoffs of you know, lace with fentanyl. So, okay, but I asked a little bit about a medication assistance. Uh, what else? Any questions about the, yeah? I have a question. Okay, so if you take, say you're addicted to a substance and you're now prescribed either the, you know, antagonist, anti-antagonist mm -hmm. or agonist, what happens if, say, you're injured or you have to have an operation mm -hmm. yeah. and now they're going to give you open-heart surgery, how do they deal with that's a good question, and, and again, I, I'm not up front. I, I, I understand this pretty well. I'm not prescribing medication assistance. I do a lot of work with um, with, with substance abusers over in the hospital, but outpatient wise, I'm not doing this. So I, I haven't, I'm not, I haven't been through that scenario. But what I anticipate is they just take them off the short term, so they can have the pain medication. Maybe, okay, my question, like, Vivitrol, from what I understand, blocks you from receiving the opioid. So if you're on this Vivitrol, which is supposed to last a month, you're in a car accident, yeah. you, you know. I know, it's a dilemma. I mean, if you've gotten a shot, then yeah, you're, you're kind of a little bit out of luck. And it kind of sad, the other thing about Vivitrol is that sometimes people, you can sneak, if you take an awful lot, something to do with the opioid, sometimes a little bit gets through. But again, that's what kind of leads to some people knocking out the rest of the tools. Um, 
All right, so it's a little bit about addiction. I guess some other stuff you want to hear, I can go over about the brain. So things that might help out as a perfect way to just our brains in the ground. You guys want to move on? Any other questions about this part? And I got a few more minutes. You want to hear this too? When you have somebody that comes in um, withdrawing, do you are you prescribing them an inpatient for withdrawal symptoms? What we do now, well, through again, withdrawal is different. It's 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 you know the autonomic system is overreactivated. What person has to call for injection? Let's talk about opioids. Right? Yeah, and so and there's muscle cramping, your 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 receptors on or something. So I, we give them supportive stuff for like like nausea and muscle cramping and maybe some of the pain that's associated with it. Not pain. We're not doing suboxone with the hospital. Okay, some places do. Anyway, if they want to go through withdrawal, we take them to withdrawal, they're miserable for two, three days and come out of it and they're okay. Uh, but then we talk about whether or not to go on with meditation. Okay, so is that enough about addictions? Okay, I can go over a couple other things, so we got a few minutes to go here. But again, it'll, it'll kind of tie in a little bit with addictions. Some other things we do to help. So let me talk a little bit more about the brain. I'll talk to my mind. It's interesting, I guess it's right. Uh, neuroplasticity. Uh, our brain. Okay, here we go. If you want to keep, when I talk with people, uh, I most of what I do is psychiatric illnesses, depression, uh, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder. Part of what I do is treat with medication, but I really encourage people to do everything they can to keep their brain healthy. And this pr particularly pertains to uh, people with addiction. So we go a little bit about keeping brain healthy. All right, and all of us can benefit from this. So I'll go through this. Um, our brain can grow and regrow. One place our brain can grow is in the synapse, right? The connections. Uh, it's amazing all the stuff that goes on, receptors and dendrites and growth and, and transcription and cellular mechanisms. It's really but we can grow new connections between these 100 billion, 85 billion, and trillion connections. We just got to establish new ones. That's what we do when we learn. We're getting new connections, right? So this growth, it, this synapse is called neuroplasticity. It's tremendously important for the health of our brain. All right? So we grow at the synapse. Neuroplasticity. Got that? Okay. Um, Oops. See with your tongue. Okay. You guys know that? You see with your tongue? Everybody close your eyes and stick out your tongue. That made me see. You want to know about seeing with your tongue? <laughs> I have to find here. The uh, seeing with your tongue. Okay. I, I, this is neuroplasticity. People that lose, remember, information in behaviors out. Okay, we don't see with our eyes. Our eyes takes in the information. It sends it all over the place, moving back to the occipital cortex, and we make a picture from that information, okay? So it's the information coming in. Our brain makes a picture. People can't see. What they've done is they put little sensors on up here that can see movement and stuff, and it sends that information down to your tongue. On your tongue, you have touch receptors. And those touch receptors uh, from the trigeminal nerve and um, a little bit from the hypoglossal nerve. They take that information into the brain. And what the brain can do when it gets that information from that stimulation of the touch fibers in your tongue, somehow they route it to the part of the brain, the occipital cortex, that makes a picture out of it. All right? We're seeing through this. And seeing through this. But the point is, is it's information, and that's neuroplasticity. That's your brain kind of establishing new connections. Uh, to be productive. So anyway, that's an example of this. Does that make any sense? All right. Now, the other thing, and, and then we're, using, we're using this idea with strokes. In the, in the past, again, developing new connections in the past, people have a stroke and knock out, you know, maybe a left arm. What you tell them is, okay, good. Why not do everything with your right arm? Okay, well, maybe better see you do the right arm, maybe the left arm, right? Well, we can establish new connections in the damaged areas from this neuroplasticity, so we're trying to utilize this concept of neuroplasticity uh, as a way to deal with growth and um, about that. Now the other, this is the other part, again, you want to keep your brain healthy, right? Um, neurogenesis, we can pump out new neurons. You used to think you were born with all the neurons you'd have, and depending on how many times you hit your head or whatever, you do some. But we can generate new neurons, stem cell 
neurons, the, you know, big boy, big girl neurons. And where they get plugged in, these new neurons, it's called neurogenesis, is a part of the brain called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus can evolve to kind of formulate and store memories for them for learning. So we get growth here. It's important, all right? Especially for preventative and demanding illnesses. Okay, so growth and regrowth of the brain. Neuroplasticity, neurogenesis, you got that, right? I think it's all kind of harmful. I'll get maybe to that. So, what helps our brain grow? And again, this has pretty like uh, back in the, the, the people with the problems with addiction and everything. So what helps it grow? A lot of things. I'll go into these a little bit, just briefly. Um, and I'll get into medication. That's more medications that were. Um, um, Omega threes I push, or some called SAMI for me, or SAMI that may help. Everybody's always asking me about over the counter stuff. Uh, no tropics, if you're familiar with that term, or versa definite, there's some information there. Actually, opioids, pain pills help out for treatment resistant depression. Hallucinogens. Hallucinogens are being used in therapeutic settings for a lot of things. So I'm not really familiar with that. But I'm not going to elaborate on those. But Starting to use neurostimulation. You guys familiar with neurostimulation? It's using electrical currency to affect different circuits and channels of the brain. We learn about what does what and what goes bad with our brain with different conditions. A good example is depression. Only about 40 to 70 percent of people respond to the illness of depression with medications. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of treatment resistance. And this neurostimulation using electrical currency. Uh, positively affect different circuits and channels of the brain seem to be productive. You guys familiar with neurostimulation? It helps. There's just some general neurostimulation that just helps brain growth and regrowth. But anyway, this is looking at uh, being used to some degree now. And much more in the future, it's being used for pain. We're really trying to work hard at pain, come up with some better better treatment for pain. So I won't elaborate on these either, but probably because I'm going to get out of here soon. Um, PCT, this is more for depression. Big one under stimulation, that's again more for depression. We're going to learn more about that. This is, I just made reference to this in the panel that makes some addition. Uh, deep brain. Psychotherapy helps. Everybody know who that is? Who that? You can recognize him. Button. Kevin, who that is? Nobody knows. Sigma Freud. Pardon? Freud. It's Sigma. Sigma Freud. Yeah. Brilliant. I mean, he was so far ahead of his time. The unconscious brain. So, second therapy. You know, there's one called mindfulness that really tries to get people to be able to. You think it reduces stress? Helps. So that helps. Um, psychotherapy. Anybody know who that is? Who? Charles Atlas. Who? Never Nobody will know him anyway. You're all too young. Here we go. Gary Player, the golfer. Gary Player. And then wait, Arnold Palmer. You had Arnold Palmer? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Gary Player was a great golfer. He's 76 there. He's always worked out. Exercise. I tell you what, I write prescriptions for exercise. Best thing you can do for your brain neuroplasticity, neurogenesis. You want to get your brain growing, regrowing? We understand the physiology of it. There's things released from pro or from muscle, protein, uh, and the natty processes. Bottom line is it promotes this growth and regrowth exercise does. What goes better? You know, everybody says exercise. We got the science behind it. In fact, what they're trying to do is they're trying to come up <laughs> with a pill that accomplishes what exercise does. And they learn about some of the enzymatic protein pathways involved with it. Pill, right? Yeah. So exercise, keep moving. Yeah. So, you, what kind of exercise do you recommend? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I, it is, and they're trying to drill down on that. You, the prescription we're kind of going with now is about 40 minutes of heart rate, one and a half times resting. Chris Walken will do that, kind of continuously, 30, 40 minutes of aerobic. Uh, weight training, we're finding out you don't have to be building up great big muscle mass. Just weight training, it gets the some of the effects from the phone going on too. They're debating about um, maybe every once in a while doing some anaerobic, some sprint work. But bottom line, the exercise will help. Now, the other thing I tell everybody, especially you guys, if you're going to be in pharmacy, I tell people to exercise if they can. Be 
good 40 minutes. Step into the elevator, it can be cumulative. And then, it, uh, I'm, a lot of stuff's coming out. If you have a desk job, computer job, whatever, once an hour, you have to do it. You never really find out. It makes a big difference short term, but also long term with your health. health. So, move around. Keep moving. It, if you want to keep it, the number one preventative for demanding illnesses, the number one cognitive enhancer is exercise. So, so you, use, you, know, you talk about trying to prevent Alzheimer's. Medications aren't going to do it. What it does it is stiffs. So, exercise. What else else? I don't have a slide. The other thing that helps, we're learning more and more about, is adequate sleep. Adequate sleep. Do not short change sleep, especially students. They show one day, one night of sleep deprivation, cortisol, cortisol levels go up, inflammation goes up. It's all about inflammation, right? Uh, performance goes down, you're on the damage. So don't short change sleep, get enough sleep. I tell people exercise, get sleep. What else? What else helps? Diet. Okay, food. We're learning more and more about the food role our food has on our general health, especially our neuronal health. And I am passionate about this because the science supports it. The bad guy food is not fat, so I'll use saturated fats. Actually, saturated fats may be kind of, kind of good for us. We use things like nuts and avocados. The bad guy food is processed food. Simple carbohydrates, and the ultimate processed food is sugar. Sugar is poison. When I talk about what's doing the most damage to us in our country in terms of addictive substances, everything sugar is about this to head out. All right, the obesity epidemic, diabetes. They're showing people with a high processed food. Processed foods are simple carbohydrates, which that works out into glucose. You guys want to hear my little spill about sugar and I? Okay, a little spill about sugar. Um, sugar is. A generic term, the most common sugar is table sugar, sucrose, a molecule of glucose, a molecule of uh, glucose, glucose. All right, glucose is the energy source of our cells. Our cells need glucose, right? We have a flood of glucose all at once into our system. Simple carbohydrates, bread, sugar. A flood of glucose, our blood sugars go high, pump in insulin, brings the blood sugars down, puts it the glucose into our liver, goes into the fat cells, and up and down, and blood sugar is good for insulin. Uh, insulin resistance might develop, and through resistance leads to inflammation. Everything about our neuronal health flows around inflammation, inflammatory processes. All right? So, glucose is good, but not a flood at once. Sugar, simple carbohydrates. Now, fructose is the other, the other simple sugar. That's even worse for us. Go straight to the liver. Then go to our cells, fructose. Remember, sugar is addictive. Fructose is the most addictive toxin. And also, it blocks a hormone called leptin. You guys familiar with leptin? It's something the fat cells release. You tell our brain, the hypothalamus part of our brain, we're full, we got enough food, shut it down. Leptin gets blocked by insulin resistance, inflammation. Sugar plays a huge role in it. It's addictive, blocks leptin. Bad things of resistance. It really is. I mean, I, science is coming out. It's okay. And so, and this is what I tell people. Nothing else. Though. Get them mad. The uh, and now shut them off. Uh, if you ever look at a food label on the back of the food label, like a granola bar, they tell you how many grams of fat, carbs, uh, sh sugar, fiber. And fiber is a good guy. Get all the fiber you can. You know, for sure. Uh, so tell me grams of fat, 15 grams. You're telling you the daily recommended amount. Get down to sugar. They have 90 grams, they won't tell you the daily recommended amount. They don't want you to know. Daily recommended amount of sugar, World Health Organization, a year ago, 25 grams. 25 grams of sugar, 10, 12 ounces of regular Coke. 10, 12 ounces, okay? <laughs> you get 10, 12 ounces of regular Coke. Yeah. And people say, I'm drinking soft drink, or I'm drinking fruit juice, 100% orange juice, great action section, okay? So you can get away with processed foods and sugar. It makes a difference. Not with weight, but so many other things too. So, anyway, that's, that's my little passion right now is trying to get our food supply changed. So, diet. Diet makes a big role for your brain health, okay? What else helps? Everybody likes to see the next one. Oh, wait. What else is not good? The other thing that helps, and this is what I'm pushing, especially with, well, everybody, but people with addictions, <laughs> that therapy, all right? 78 million, 60% of our household have pets. Probably have around 60 billion a year we pay, 
we spend on our pets. It's not because we're being good to animals. We eat the animals, right? We're doing it because the animals are good for us. The way pet therapy works is there's a hormone called oxytocin. Oxytocin is one of the hot hormones right now. Released by our hypothalamus, it's a connection hormone. When we release oxytocin into our brains, it kind of diminishes fear and anxiety from the less fearful and anxious. It you goes down to feel better, promotes trust and collaboration. We trust and collaborate, we're social. We get along better with people. So oxytocin is important for our brains. What promotes the release of oxytocin? Connection with the uh, visual, touch, verbal. Animals. Number one, they have all the emotional circuits you we do. We're pretty shamanistic species. We just think, well, they ones have emotions. Dogs wave their tail, they get a treat. They really care about you and they have to listen to it. When they connect with us, it's not for treats. Because they like us. You know, and that's important to them. And plus, animals have oxytocin. Domesticated animals have more than we do. We bred it into them. All right? So the reason animals are good for us is because when we interact, they don't only get us out because walking or whatever, but it helps this oxytocin system. And I push it, especially with people who get back to addictions, okay? A lot of them are living alone or whatever. Get a dog, get a cat, get a rat. I had somebody bring me a pet rat from the time with people. So pet therapy helps. And I, I go over this brain fitness, which just things you can do. The other, when I talk about keeping your brain healthy, exercise, nutrition, sleep, learning new things. Learn new things, rest of your life. Don't have to be caught. Learning promotes its growth and regrowth. You have to be called to learning like a history lesson. It could be a behavioral learning, like a new activity, a new craft, social learning, new situations. It's always to to a set up. And the last thing is, oh yeah, meditation. Anybody know who that guy is? Mm -hmm. Last little quiz. Anybody recognize him in the red? The Lama. My hero, Dalai Lama. He's an amazing guy. He's got a great brain. Every year the Dalai Lama meets with the top neuroscientist in the world. I know who these guys are, I read up on them, read their stuff. The top neuroscientist, he wants to meet with them to learn all he can about the brain and how it applies to what Buddhism is trying to be promoted over the years in terms of trying to make brains better. They can't wait to see him and his guys, so they just can't wait to scan their brains. They show when people go through meditative training, there's changes in, this, in circuitry that's involved in anxiety and a lot of other things. Meditation, yoga helps. Uh, physically, we're understanding the dynamics of that too. Get away from TV, get away from network news, and network news, everything's new. Uh, and then the last is something called mindfulness. You ever recognize that guy? See, for the younger day, I should put up there. That's, that's, that's my daughter. I eat a dog, I just throw it in and catch it. And the reason I put that up there, if I'm the seal of her face, she's totally in the moment. And the, the mindfulness, here's my little spiel ball mindfulness. Wrap it up. Uh, people familiar with mindfulness? Mindfulness. Okay, mindfulness is a hot, a hot topic in, in uh, behavior health. My spin on mindfulness. Here we go. Mindfulness. The most important part of mindfulness is understanding the moment. All we have, all we've got, is the moment, right? Pass over and done with. The future doesn't exist. The future five seconds from now, let alone five minutes, five years from now. All we have is the moment, right? Because we're so caught up with negative thinking. Fears, anxieties, regrets, and con remember conscious awareness, here comes conscious awareness. When we consciously focus on all this negative stuff, fears, anxieties, whatever, we miss the moment. We can't embrace it, we can't enjoy it, most importantly, we can't function at our best. Y'all can relate to that, right? Missing the moment? We all miss the moment all the time. We all miss the moment all the time. It's the curse of our species. Like every other life forms in the moment. Dogs, you get envious five seconds ago, five seconds from now. All right, we're starting to understand what part of the brain is negative thinking comes from. It's kind of a limbic system. Fears, anxiety, stress connects the rest of the brain. When we go there, in just a moment. Relate to that? They're kind of neat thing, nothing else. Back to the brain, neurostimulation. They're working on a device to shut this down. This tendency to go to fears, anxiety, Put on this skull cap for simulation. People developing this device? Military, snipers. Snipers put it on, there's nothing but the moment, nothing but the target, nothing to distract. No regrets. Although this happened last week, I'm still upset about it. No fears, anxieties about the future. When I got my lunch, what happens if the global economy collapses? You know, 
<laughs> a few times. Um, it's kind of like being in zone in sports. Can you guys recognize your kind of relate to that? Being, you know, nothing sports up at the moment. Okay, it's great. We don't get enough. Of it. We aren't seeing the circuitry with that. So conscious awareness. What conscious awareness does is kind of goes to that. There's when conscious awareness has something to get its attention outside of us, something engaging. I'm trying to figure out how many people got conscious awareness on the board. Um, it does pretty well. There's nothing in conscious awareness that's attention that turns in what's called the default. Where does it go? Anywhere it goes, all this negative stuff, fears, anxieties, regrets. But it also goes to what's going on through our body. Remember, our brain pays attention to our body. Pain, whatever, default. So mindfulness is trying to be mindful when your conscious awareness part of your brain is going all this negative stuff. It's almost like conscious awareness being aware of what conscious awareness Sense. That's where meditation suffers. So mindfulness is a good way to go. There's so many problems. Especially I'm just kind of wrapping up with uh All right, so that's kind of my I wouldn't anticipate that I'd be talking more than a half hour when you close the this. So I'm kind of done. Anybody have any other questions that you did want to ask or okay. Okay, so uh two so okay again I'm you know, Take home points, okay? I can't have that enough. Disease model of addictions. Try to understand that. And then try to, if you understand that, try to ch change attitudes towards people with, with addictions. They need our help. Try to keep your own brains healthy and try to help other people keep their brains healthy. All right, you guys. Yeah. All right, will you join me in thanking Dr. Bundy? Yeah, uh, you guys don't get to go yet because we're going to finish our quiz. Okay, but Dr. Bunny, if you had, you were going to say something. I'm sorry. No, I'm just going to thank people for showing up. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I didn't bring it with me. Yeah. Maybe you want my number? Because this is my press time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. You want my office number? Yeah. Let's see how we do here. Do you remember how many nerves? Yeah, and yeah. the brain cells we have. Okay, for information, okay. think about it. You guys. Seriously, this will be good. This will be good. Yeah, that would be a good thing you can make. Okay. You see what you did? You guys are looking for 85 billion, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you gotta figure out which one of those numbers is closer to 85 billion. set a record tonight. We have never had 100% all the way through. Are you guys going to get it tonight? Yeah. Is this the night? Yes. All right, let's see. <laughs> Here goes. Oh, oh we lost one. Right. Neurogenesis. The beginning of new neurons. But that's pretty good though. 89%. That's almost an A anyhow. So, all right. Here we go. Reorganizing the dendritic sprouts and making new connections and reinforcing certain pathways. What do we call that? All right, neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity. And the last question is, you guys had this at the get going. Physical changes, organic changes in the brain. True or false? Thanks. Chronic alcoholics, when they die, 
and you autopsy their brains. Their brains are larger, smaller, or no change. Larger, smaller, or no change. And it's just a compelling, I mean they're 10 to 15 percent smaller. You've got, you've got loss of neurons chronically, and so when you talk about organic changes, absolutely positively. But I wasn't telling too many people in here anything they didn't already know. All right, you are free to go. Thanks again for coming very much, you guys. Um, drive safely, enjoy what is left of some very nice...